I think she are from the Dallas, uh, Prior and the Digital Web with YC platform. We are having this collaboration with YouTube and uh, very happy about in Dallas, we are Singapore the Digital Web Advice Pro platform. Uh, it's meant to be very simple, easy to use, uh, and then geared towards helping you uh, work towards your financial goals. You have a lot of free content that you can just go to YouTube and watch yourself. If you want to go ahead and share your email address with us after this event, then we can also reach out with you with a uh, Really, some curated videos of uh, that escape the worst writers uh, so that it can never be more. I have done a few of these sessions for the corporates, right? So I go to companies, I've shared this, um, a lot of financial tips. But I think for writers, it's a lot different, right? Well, for you guys, uh, somewhat like a business owner, you're fully responsible for what's in stopping you or pride equal, right? And you need to also take into account, uh, you know, whether you are able to, all uh, right, I'm just at for take. Whether your equipment is spoiled or not. You know, whether you have other family emergencies. While it's very liberating for you to as a gig economy worker, you have a lot of autonomy when you want to work, how hard you want to work. Right? But that kind of uh, freedom and rest come, comes with responsibility as well, right? So it's important for you to, you know, manage your finances even more carefully. Some of the financial commitments that you may have, right? So this is for, for those of you who have uh, housing plans, right? Or, or maybe even saving up for the down payment in the future. So definitely, you know, your rentals, your monthly arrays for your uh, mortgage as well. Uh, you also may have plans to go and get a BTO, right? Or get a resale flat. So these are all costs that you need, uh, your own expenses that you need to take into account, right? And then there is also debt obligations for yourself as well, right? Some of you might be on buy now, pay later uh, plans. You might have credit card debts as well, right? You you may also have other personal loans that you need to pay off, be it for you know, your polytechnic, your tertiary education, and so on, right? So these also add up to your financial commitments that might be holding you back uh, in terms of your, your, uh, your plans around riding more or less. Very obviously, unlike employees, right? So when, when I go to work, I don't have to worry whether, you know, whether I have a keyboard available for me at work, right? Or whether I have a laptop at work. These are all provided for me as an employee, right? But for riders, you know, you guys are responsible for your own equipment. Uh, you know, you have to make sure that you, you pay for your own petrol, diesel, you have to pay for your own vehicle maintenance as well, right? And then, of course, lastly, your, your daily living expenses, right? You, uh, many of you guys are providing for your family. So these, all these costs adds up, right? Work flexibility doesn't equate to financial uh, flexibility, right? Um, I mean, all of us, we have a minimal living standards that we need, need to uh, take, take into consideration, right? So for us to be financially stable, I think... Uh, especially as riders, you need to take into account there are a few things that you need to do, right? So number one, you have to track your finances even more carefully than you know, regular employees. That's one thing. The other two is the other thing is to you know make sure that you have enough cash kept for emergencies, right? Because there there again, as a someone like a business owner yourself, you have to take care of your finances for any business exigencies as well, right? And the last thing I think is more for Chong and some of the younger folks around here. You need to decide how to use uh, and understand how to use CPF for your financial goals, right? Because again, for employees, we are forced to go and make CPF contribution. You know, some of you guys uh, probably are only forced to make uh, MediSafe contribution for now. Uh, in the future, you might be uh, automatically enrolled to make CPF contribution if you are below the 30 years old. Right, so yeah, knowing how to use CPF is a uh, flexibility that you may have, right? So whether to use it or not, I'm going to cover it later as well. Very quickly, uh, there are some food panda re uh, in food panda related uh, deals and uh, and also resources that can help you out with some of these uh, financial challenges that you may have, right? So the first one will be um, the free coverage that you would get uh, as a rider, right? So uh, are all of you are aware that you have this uh, coverage. So this is the coverage that you're going to get when you ride, right? So uh, that would include uh, 70k coverage for accidental death and dismemberment, 1k per accident for medical uh, expenses, and another $700 for loss of income. Right. Uh, this coverage is, uh, I think, it's a baseline. But if you again, you want to get more coverage, the second QR code would actually get you to the deals page on the Rider website. I believe there are some other insurance company that you can sign up some deals with, like I think with Snack Income. I'm sure Food Panda has done their job to. Make sure that the rates are competitive, premiums are competitive and it's suitable for riders. How do you track your finances more carefully? The way to think about um, your finances, vital signs is uh, similar to when you, every time you go and see a doctor, right? You need to, they'll go and take your blood pressure. They'll go and uh, 
um, also find out how what's your heartbeat rate, right? So so it's important for you to really keep track of your financial vital signs, right? I'm going to go through some of the financial vital signs later on, right? But it will by knowing your financial vital signs, you will be able to understand whether you are in a dire financial situation, right? Whether you're in financial stress, you will be able to determine if you have too much debt, whether you can afford certain luxury ones, right? Whether you can maybe afford an iPhone for your children, whether you can afford to, uh, you know, buy a new bike, right? So these are in, these are important financial decisions, right? Whether you're layering more debt or you are just living in a state of more financial certainty. And of course, last thing is whether you are ready for longer term financial goals. Maybe it's not about retirement. Maybe it's more about uh, affording for your children's uh, tertiary education, right? So these are important. This will help, uh, knowing your financial vital signs will help you understand whether you are ready for all of this, lah, right? And, you know, what is the equivalent of blood pleasure or, you know, your heartbeat rate uh, when it comes to your finances? Um, you know, we can look at it very simply, right? One is, how, what's your personal income statement, right? Your cash inflow and outflow every month, right? And then the other aspect that you should be also be looking out for is, you know, how much asset have you built up, right? Uh, so that will be your personal balance sheet. Sounds a bit abstract, but there are some useful tools that you can uh, make use of uh, to, to help you tr uh, track some of uh, these vital signs. How should you be thinking about spending prudently? I would group our income into three different buckets using 50% for financial needs, 30% for wants, which are like luxury spends, uh, discretionary spends. And then the final 20%, uh, as much as possible, channel it to savings. It's also very important for us to be mindful that these are really high level rule of thumb. For some people, they have a lot more dependence, right? They have to take care of their parents. They have to take care of uh, their children as well. To them, maybe they have a very large percentage of their monthly income going into their um, financial needs, right? So the percentage may be 70% even for financial needs. Right, so I think uh, I'll go through some, some ways to go and understand why, why, what are your what, wants and your needs, right? But, you know, at the end of that financial planning session for yourself, right, you should roughly have a gauge of like what is that 50, 30, 20 ratio for yourself, right? Again, because everyone needs are different. Some of you might still be, uh, you know, studying. You don't really have a uh, need to take care of a family. Your, your wants uh, might be larger and your needs might be lower, right? It's really dependent on um, your life stage. How much you want to, you have to spend now, right? The keyword is have, not you want. You have to spend now. Those are financial needs. What you would love to spend, right? A new iPhone, a new smartphone, right? Those are wants, right? And then of course, saving more money for financial needs in the future, right? That is the savings part of things, right? And of course, when you think of thinking about needs, uh, a lot of it is, is also around your debt obligations that I covered just now, uh, your daily expenses, utilities, groceries, your petrol, diesel, so on and so forth, right? Um, ones will be things, again, enjoyment, right? Things like you're treating your family to a nice meal and so on, right? So this has to be reviewed periodically and adjusted, adjusted if necessary, right? So I like to use the example of, of CPF. Uh, CPF does a very good job for us employees, uh, you know, when it comes to financial planning, right? If the money is shifted out before even getting into our bank account, then we naturally won't think of spending it. Right, so that's one way to think about you know paying yourself first, paying for your financial goals first, or allocating money away for savings first. Right, if you are disciplined and you shift away a part of your money into savings, then you don't have to worry that you will overspend it. Right, so so that's that's how I try to encourage people to think about uh you know forcing themselves to save. CPF contribution is automatically deducted. You don't even have to think about it. So if you have nev never have it, you know, never know it existed, you won't spend it. Right. And then the way that the government do it is also very uh, very smart. They split it across three different accounts for different financial goals, right? Ordinary account got a, a certain goal, a special account has a certain goal, right? So so these are also how they help us with financial planning, right? Um, so it's not, not trying to do a CPF talk here. I'm not trying to do a CPF talk here, but it's really trying to let you know that, you know, we, we can be as deliberate about our financial plans as with how CPF is structured, right? So... You can deduct for your savings and investment first, then later on you think about your wants and needs. I talk about top down, right? How do you try to split your income into wants, needs, and savings, right? Um, the other way to track your finances is also based on what you're actually spending now, not, not something conceptual or, or just a 
uh, the rule of thumb, right? So how you can do this manually, right, is through, uh, you know, really just looking through into the details, right? So first, you need to find out how much you're earning, right? Determine all your income sources. So some of you may be riding just as a part-time job. So you may have other uh, income sources, right? Most important thing is really just having a good view of how much income that you have in totality on a monthly basis, right? So that's the first thing. And then the next thing is to, you know, gather all your expenses and keep track of it. Gather all your income. Then later on, you need to calculate and tabulate all your expenses. So some of these uh, would may not be recurring expenses, right? I think for, for many of us, things like groceries, utilities will be recurring expenses. But buying, let's say, a fridge or buying a laptop, this may happen once every year or once every two years. Right, so it's also important to take into account all these account expenses, including your motor insurance as well. One way to help you with tabulating all these expenses is because you know we don't keep all our receipts when we spend uh, make a, a purchase, right? So you know we can also consolidate our credit card bills, uh, use a bank account transactions to help us find out how what, how much we're actually spending, right? So a lot of this is already digitized. You know, if you are only using one or two bank accounts one or two credit cards, it's actually quite easy for you to go and track, track all of these. After you get all that lo whole laundry list of your expenses, then you can uh, break down all your expenses into wants and needs, right? And this is a very personal, subjective decision, right? So for some people, after a hard day of work, maybe drinking a, a, a Liho bubble tea is a, is a need, it's not a want, right? Then then feel free to put it as a want, uh, feel, feel free to put it as a need, not a want, right? So, so make, make that uh, discretionary decision on whether your spend is a one or a need, right? And, you know, for some of us, we feel bad about spending on our wants because we feel that, oh, that money could be used for other more important, more important purposes, right? Um, the way to think about it is to allocate a sum of money for like a treat yourself fund, right? So some, sometimes when I have a bad day at work, uh, because of some, yeah, some friction at work, right? I may I may choose to you know spend some money to treat myself, right? So so do allocate some money uh, as a treat yourself fund so that you feel better about your expenses, right? And yeah, I think along the way you will be able to identify what is a reasonable budget uh, for your for yourself. And as long as you are not overspending your income or you you are not. If you're not saving quickly enough, then you, you may have to cut down on your ones. I think these, all these are pretty self-explanatory. And the last thing is, you know, you have to, uh, at, at the end of all this, you'll be able to keep track of your savings, right? Um, obviously, what I talk about is conceptual, right? Uh, it's uh, as much as possible how you want to go and allocate some money for your spends, uh, plans, budgeted spends, and uh, wants and needs and so on, right? But uh, as you actually receive your income, as you actually spend that money, right, you, you have to keep track of how much you are saving because that's the desired outcome, right? And, and you know, there will, there will definitely be things that throw you off your uh, trajectory because finances, uh, there, will, there will be ad hoc expenses, right? So keep track of your uh, savings so that you know that you are still uh, in progress. Yeah, so, so this, I talk a lot about it and I feel that some of this, even for myself, I find it difficult to do, right, in terms of tracking your expenses. Uh, and, and this is where there are some free tools from the government that will be very, very helpful for you to, uh, you know, get started on this, right? Uh, obviously, endowers don't have that uh, capability to build some of the tools here, right? And you can use um, SG Findex or My Money Sense to, you know, capture some of this information. And, and the, beauty, the beauty of this thing is, do, selling a bit of Koyo for the government. But the beauty of this is that these are all automatically put from your banks, put from your insurance company, put from your uh, some of the other financial apps out there, right? So you don't have to go ahead and take a spreadsheet and, you know, or, or even a, a pen and paper to write out all of this, right? It's all automatically put as long as you agree to share that information to the SG Index, right? Uh, this is a, a mock-up of one of the accounts that I've seen before. Right, where, you know, they, they, again, they ask you the questions that I've asked, asked you just now, right? What is your income level? How much do you plan to spend, right? Um, so you are able to come up with your own uh, income, so, sort of like an income, a planned income statement for yourself. 
right? And and of course, uh, because it's pulling live data from uh, SGF index, you know, if you have certain expenses that um, they are recorded by the insurance company or by the banks for your bank loans, all of these will also be automatically uh, pulled out as well, right? So there's that budgeting element of it. Then there's also that real uh, real time data part of things. Okay, and, and the last thing is that, you know, uh, they also have a lot of financial literacy content, right? That can help you understand more about financial planning, managing your money. The other part of thing, I thought about income statement already. So this is on assets and liabilities, right? So, um, yeah, again, it's, it's the same concept, right? They, they pull data from the insurers, they pull data from the banks, they pull data from, uh, you know, IRAs, uh, CPF as well, right? So all of these will be automatically linked and then the data will be reflected real time, right? So you have a good, pretty good gauge of uh, where your finances are at that point of time, right? So try out the tracker. Uh, if, you, if you find that whatever I shared today is too complicated, maybe difficult to start with, try the, try the app. It's really meant, for, uh, meant to be really simple and easy to get started. The next thing is uh, why you need emergency funds. We talk a, a little bit more about how you track your finances, uh, you know, your personal balance sheet. Uh, the next thing it need, that you should do also is to have an emergency fund, right? So what is an emergency fund, right? It's a reserve pool of money that's meant for unexpected expenses, right? And th these unexpected expenses could be your medical bills that are not expected, emergency home repairs, things that are not within expectation. So it's meant for emergency. What should you have in your emergency fund? typically three to six months worth of uh, expenses for yourself, right? Uh, it could be more for some of you who prefer to be a bit more conservative and the amount will be naturally be bigger, right? If you have more dependents uh, in your family, right? So that's something to take note of, right? So in this example, you know, there's uh, for, for, that, for this particular person, there's food, there's rental payments, there's utilities, transport bills, and so on, right? And, and that amount is $3,100. For some of you who don't need to, uh, who stay off with your parents, you don't have to pay for, you, you know, your mortgage or rental, then the amount might be smaller, right? But the basis is st still anywhere between three, three to 12 months of your expenses. And of course, if there's anything that's uh, too big of an uh, outflow, then you might want to consider taking insurance coverage to, uh, to cover your, your risk, right? The criteria for emergency fund, I think this is very important. Uh, I've heard of people using stocks investments as uh, emergency fund, right? They invested like maybe $5,000 and they feel that I invest the money. Uh, the, I can, as long as I can sell my investment and get the money out as soon as possible, that is a source of emergency fund. Um, actually, that's not really true, right? Because uh, we don't want a case of, you know, in, in a case of emergency, when you want to sell the investment, you realize that the investment is losing 30 or 40%, right? The, the criteria for an emergency fund is that, is that it has to be reliable it has to be accessible and it has to be liquid, All right? So definitely your insurance uh, endowment plans, uh, the longer term endowment plans wouldn't make sense. Uh, your single stocks that you buy on SGX, ETFs, those are also not good uh, vehicles for emergency fund, right? Because there's volatility involved, right? So you would probably see a, a lot of these uh, investment products that are mentioned as a potential emergency fund uh, vehicles, right? So in the banks, you, I think all of us have a, um, probably have a bank account. We have a savings account, right? There's also high yield savings account. Th those could be the those, uh, accounts that give you additional plus one, plus one interest rates, right? So those are also good emergency fund uh, vehicles, right? Um, there are also fixed deposits and short-term endowments as well, right? But these often have lock-ins, right? And may not work very well uh, as an emergency fund, okay? Uh, the same goes for T-bills and even uh, Singapore savings bonds, right? They are minimally lock up for six months or, or one month, right? Uh, something that I want to share with you is uh, money market funds or cash management account. So these are investments, right, that... Uh, investment vehicles that has an underlying investment in fixed deposits, right? But because it's uh, held in the fund structure, it's possible for you to get your uh, investment within two to three days of and, and get a cash back uh, within two to three days, right? So these are also, it's very similar returns to fixed deposits, but you, you don't get the locked in. For endowers, we carry a 
product called Cashmark Secure. This fund is, uh, if this product is effectively invested in fixed deposits and T-bills, but uh, because it's held in a fund vehicle, right, you don't, you can get withdraw and get the money back within two to three business days, right? So it's a, it's a compromise between, you know, that uh, high yield of uh, fixed deposits as well as the liquidity of a savings account. The principle is not secured, uh, but because it's effectively invested in uh, fixed deposits and, uh, you know, very safe uh, financial fin deposits from banks, so there is very, very minimal volatility. Yeah, so you can see that there are other financial products out that we carry that has volatility, right? But uh, cash flow secure is pretty much um, one way out. Sometimes, you know, the scale or the graph is very misleading, right? Uh, it could very well be 20, 30% increase decrease uh for, for this chart but if you see uh the movement is actually just two to three percent right relative to the principle yeah so that's something to take note of lah. very low volatility uh and it's a uh, yeah good good to try out uh if you want again the the best of both worlds in some sense right that stability state the stability of a fixed deposit product but also uh the flexibility to withdraw uh, anytime it's not SDIC insured. Typically, uh, for a product to be SDIC insur insured, it has to be a savings account, a fixed deposit, uh, or even a endow short-term endowment plan, right? So these uh, instruments are typically created by banks or other financial institutions, and and therefore, um, the basically the government also for force the financial institution to buy insurance on on their own product, right? So that it's SDIC it's SDIC insured. Right. Um. For this, it's not. Um. But the underlying investment might be SDIC insured. One thing to uh, point out is that there's a very big difference between saving and investing. Right. Saving, you are really, really just making sure that you have you allocate some money aside for emergency. Uh. There's no volatility involved. Right. But for investing, you know, you have to. Uh. Eventually, you will make returns for of it. But, and you might you have to expect short term volatility. Right. So. When you put money in fixed deposits, right, it's more like a form of saving, right, not a form of investing, right. But when you invest to get, you know, to beat inflation or to get higher returns, then there will be some volatility involved, right. Um, so it's important to get your savings part right first, right. So rather than immediately jump into investing, right. Nowadays, there's a lot of uh, apps that make investing very, very accessible, right. You can start off investing even with one dollar. Uh, but are, are we truly ready to invest? I think that's the question that I think only you, you yourself can answer, right? Uh, I will go through a checklist on when are you ready to invest very soon? Yeah, so when are you ready to start investing and contributing to your CPF? Why do I put these two together, right? Because contributing to CPF is also a very long-term endeavor, right? I think for um, um for you riders, you have the, you, you're not forced to make CPF contribution uh, as with employees. Right. Um, but there are definitely some benefits when it comes to voluntary CPF contribution. Right. But again, this is a long term commitment. It's very similar to investing. Uh, uh, so th therefore, I put them together. Right. Before you think about starting investing and uh, contributing to CPF. So this is the checklist of things that you need to do. Right. The first thing you need to do is to make sure that you pay off all your high interest debt. Credit card debt nowadays is around 25% per annum interest rates. Right, so it, it doesn't make sense for you to uh, pretty much prioritize anything else other than paying off credit card debt. Right, so that's something that's very, very important. Pay off a credit, uh, high interest credit card debt first. Right, then the next thing is to make sure that you have a clear view of your short and mid-term expenses and cash outflow. Right, because again, it's a long-term commitment, right? Investing as well as uh, making a CPF contribution. If you know that you're going to let's say, uh, make a housing down payment in two or three years' time, you, you wouldn't want to go and uh, make a CPF contribution, especially if you have not set aside money for the down payment, right? So that has to be also be considered, right? After all the, you know, thinking about your current expenses, thinking about your assets and liabilities, you also have to, you know, plot two or three years ahead and think about your, uh, you know, financial plans, right? Uh, the next thing is, I, I covered this already, you need to build an emergency fund, right? Just so to make sure that you are, you feel, there's a sense of assurance that if anything happens, you will be taken care of, your family is being taken care of, right? Uh, after that, you can think about setting off, right, recurring or one-off uh, CPF or uh, investment options, right? 
Uh, the last thing is, uh, if you are really, really ready, then you can research about the different investment options out there and find what, whatever that's appropriate for you, right? But the boring thing is you have to start off with doing your financial planning first, right? So that you know where you are and then how, how, far, how far can you push your finances. Help you understand a bit more of what CPF can do for you, right? Um, okay, I think for all of you, you all uh, pretty much uh, have to you have to make me uh, co mandatory MediSafe contribution, right? Uh, but for voluntary CPF contribution, uh, just to highlight, it will be spread across the three different accounts, uh, similar to what an employee will be uh, getting themselves into, right? So you'll be there. There will be contribution into your ordinary account, your MediSafe account, as well as your special account. Right, so what you can do with your ordinary account, I think all of us pre are pretty familiar, right? You would you will be able to pay for your housing mortgage or your housing down payment using your ordinary account, right? Of course, you can make some investments with CPF, but I, I don't think that's the primary purposes uh, for for um, riders, right? Um, you can also pay for your family's uh, tertiary education, right? So some of you might be beneficiaries of, uh, you know, your sibling, uh, using your sibling's CPF to pay for your uh, third poly, uh, poly fees and things like that, right? So that's what you can do with an ordinary account. It has the widest range of use. Uh, it could be for retirement, could be for investment, could be for housing, right? There's also the MediSafe account. So this will be used to pay for your uh, integrated shoe brand premiums, right? So that's something that, again, is mandated on us. Uh, it can also pay for some outpatient as, as well as uh, hospitalization bills as well, okay? And lastly, the special account, which is honestly not very special, right? It's, it's meant for retirement. It has a high interest rate. That's all. Okay, so this is what you can use your, your CPF, even though people say that CPF is locked up. Uh, the use is ultimately still going to be a lot less flexible than cash, right? Uh, but having a sense of what you can use it for, uh, maybe there's a chance that um, there, there's an overlap between your financial goals as well as what you can use CPF for, right? So for some of you, it might be that you want to set aside some money for, for your uh, housing anyway, right? So might as well top up your CPF. So that's a consideration. Okay, so what are the pros and cons of uh, voluntary CPF contribution? Again, this is not the MediSafe contribution. This is the contribution into the ordinary special and MediSafe account, right? The, the pros of it is that, you know, the first thing is that it's safe from debtors. It's safe from debtors. Uh. It's, uh, you cannot dig... The, your debtors cannot even claim even if you are bankrupt, right? So it's, it, it works very differently from our cash assets or, or any other assets, right? Uh, second thing is that uh, it gives higher interest rates, right? So uh, you might be familiar that uh, CPF gives 2.5% interest rate for OA, 4% for MediSafe and special account, right? Um, you actually also enjoy an, a step up 1% interest rate uh, for your SA and MA, uh, SA, MA and OA, uh, up to sixty thousand dollars for the first, up to the first sixty thousand dollars in your in those account, right? If you are below the age of fifty five, and if you are above the age of fifty five, there is also another additional one percent for the first thirty thousand dollars, right? So it could be as high as six percent risk free from the government, right? And and they sort of structure it to help uh Singaporeans with low CPF balances, right? So consider having some a bit of at, at least a bit of CPF monies, right? And then the last thing uh, for you guys is also that you enjoy some tax relief from it, right? Uh, you may not feel that uh, you are, uh, it's, it's top of your priority, right? But if you are riding and you're earning like five, four, five thousand uh, dollars, then there might be a significant tax relief that you are enjoying from CPF contribution, right? So that's also something for you to consider, right? The cons, I think I already talked about it already. There's a lack of flexibility and, and also there's going to be a lockup, right? For you to go and use CPF or, or even withdraw CPF as cash, uh, you have to reach, reach the age of 55, okay? Or, or maybe you have to go and relinquish your uh, Singaporean citizenship, la, but I, I don't think that's really something that we want to think no of. So there's also some materials that's been provided by Foodpanda. I'm, I'm not very sure whether, whether you all saw it on Instagram, right? But this is really a summary of what's going to happen uh, come 2024, right? When, when the new government, when the new laws come in, Right, so if you are at the age uh, 30 and below, then CPF contribution will be mandatory. Food Panda will also be making the employer part of the contribution as well. Right? Um, and it works very similar to how uh, employee like myself would be uh, 
uh, using CPF, right? Twenty percent is from food panda. Seventeen percent is from from twenty percent is from yourself. Sorry, seventeen percent will be from food panda, right? Uh, and the contribution is gonna slowly step up to that twenty and seventeen percent, right? Uh, yeah. For if you're above twenty, uh, above thirty, then it's not gonna be mandatory. Okay. Yeah. So very quick summary of today's session right like you 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 know we have when it comes to financial planning there are a few things that we can work on right how much you work how hard you work how many uh, orders that you can take up with right you can also control your spending you can definitely also control your financial plans right but you definitely cannot control the weather you cannot control short-term investment returns uh no matter how much research you do right um and you, obviously you also have no control of speculative investment Right, so the the survey that we have done with food panda riders show that there's a quite a significant number of riders that are looking at more high risk investments like cryptocurrency, uh, you know, uh, looking at lottery and things like that, right? Um, yeah, but those are speculative in nature, right? And you, there's there's no certainty of outcome, right? So as much as possible, we want to do things that we have in control of, so that we also feel great, a greater sense of ownership in our finances, uh, and and we can work towards greater financial stability. I think I covered a little bit about Endowers. Um, you know, we are a digital wealth advisory platform. Uh, you can think of us as we are a digital financial advisor, right? Basically, that's it. Uh, we don't, we are not a brokerage. We don't pick single funds or single stocks for, uh, for you, right? Or you don't allow you to pick single st uh, stocks or fund, but you can definitely try us out. We will guide you to invest in the right uh, solutions. This is what our clients use us for. You know, we give advice, you know, we give access to lower cost products uh, that are often not available to retail investors. Our cost is very low as a digital platform. Uh, it, and also the last thing is that we, we are very, a very secure platform. If you are interested to learn more, again, we have a lot of content online, be it on YouTube or blog site. So you can read some of this uh, information online as well. This is a special offer that is part of that food and now collaboration that we have. Typically, we only have a, like a thousand dollar minimum investment for food panda riders only um, if you sign up using this code we will allow you to be able to invest a smaller amount and still enjoy our services for free please scan this code opening an account is very easy it's all done through SingPass. so try our services you get you get to use us uh, pretty much for free uh, for the first year up to uh, ten thousand dollars we use unit trust uh, but we use very low cost uh, unit trust Unit trusts have uh, a lot of different underlying investments, right? So equities, different type of equities, different kind of fixed income, different type of, uh, you know, even when you fix income, there are also very, very safe things like fixed deposits, TBUs. Okay, that's about it. Uh, if you have any feedback, uh, feel, free to, feel free to let me know. You can speak to me.